For Jim Schmanke, Sunday, May the 18th, was just another working day. Oh, the day was just sunny, beautiful, calm, no wind, just perfect for cutting in the woods. And we were just to add a few more acres to cut. And Sunday morning, we wanted to get it out of our way. And for local geologist Dorothy Stoffel, it seemed a perfect morning to have her birthday treat, a flight over the mountain organized by her husband. I thought to myself that the mountain had really gone back into dormancy and, and a sense of disappointment that we wouldn't see anything. On the contrary, Dorothy Stoffel would be the first person to see a unique and catastrophic event that was to change the face of the earth and nearly take her life. Since March the 20th, Mount St. Helens had been rocked by over 10,000 earthquakes. But by the end of the month, an ominous bulge had swollen grotesquely on its northern flank. It didn't take us long to realize that the bulge indicated that there was magma coming into the volcano. It was sort of inflating the volcano like a water balloon and that this was going to lead to something catastrophic. Mount St. Helens was about to be transformed from a beautiful national park to a scene of total devastation. I knew this area very well, and nothing in my wildest dreams prepared me for this moonscape that was left after the events of, of May 18. On Sunday, May the 18th, 1980, the sequence of seismic events that had been building for the past two months was about to come to a final and unexpected conclusion. At 8.32 and 11 seconds, a last gigantic surge of magma forced its way up the volcano and caused the biggest earthquake so far. This earthquake, 5.1 on the Richter scale, triggered a cataclysmic series of events. At 8.32 and 20 seconds, the earthquake shook free the bulge. It began to slide down the mountain, the biggest landslide ever recorded. Soon it had reached a speed of 100 miles per hour. At 8.32 and 40 seconds, it ripped away the rock holding back the supercharged bubble of magma, like a cork exploding from a champagne bottle. A tremendous explosion. This sudden catastrophic blast out of the side of the mountain stunned the scientists. The Mount St. Helens eruption was quite unique because instead of erupting initially vertically, because of the configuration of the bulge on the north flank, because of this debris avalanche event that broke off the north flank, the explosion was directed horizontally, or nearly horizontally, what we call a directed blast, or a laterally directed blast. And this event is, is a very rare kind of event. We had just cleared the crater in this enormous lower blast. As Dorothy's aircraft dived away to the south, the sideways blast fanned out towards the north at speeds of up to 700 miles per hour. So the blast cloud itself consisted of fragments of the cryptodome, some of them very large, in fact some of them as large as houses initially, um, fragments of the old northern flank of the volcano, and later on during the blast, the, the materials that formed the summit of the volcano and part of the interior of the volcano. So this was a cloud of debris moving at very high speeds. At 8.32 and 50 seconds, this moving wall of rocks sped towards a ridge five miles to the north. On it stood the lone volcanologist, David Johnston. He observed the beginning of the eruption. In fact, he radioed to us in Vancouver and announced that the eruption had begun. Vancouver, Vancouver, this is it! 
David Johnston became the victim of Mount St. Helens. He was 30 years old. Meanwhile, the enormous landslide, half a mountain, careered into Spirit Lake, burying it and killing 84-year-old Harry Truman, who had refused to go. At 8.34 and 30 seconds, the blast cloud reached the next ridge eight miles to the north. On the ridge top, a local volcano enthusiast, Jerry Martin, was on CB radio to his friends. It would be his last message before he died. from the start of the blast, it showed no signs of stopping. It starts to incorporate the surrounding air. And as it sucks in the air, that air is going to get heated up because the magma was at 900 degrees C. And you know that hot air expands and rises. So for a while, the blast was actually gaining momentum by sucking in air and expanding. Three minutes after the eruption, the blast cloud ripped through the landscape, heading towards Jim Schmanke and his workmates. They were totally unaware that Mount St. Helens had even erupted. The first time I noticed there was something wrong was when Diaz came running down through the woods, screaming the volcano's exploding. Just looking at him, you know, you could tell he was scared to death. But we weren't worried even at that time because there was no noise, there was nothing. Then all of a sudden, we heard this stuff. I mean, and we don't know what it was, but it was... You could hear it coming through the trees. First, it was kind of like a bunch of rocks and stuff. The noise was just deafening. I mean, it was just like big jets or freight trains just crashing through the woods, and it just turned black right in front of us. I mean, I just knew at that time I had to turn and just try to get out of there. It was unbelievable. I mean, it just took the woods and they were gone. I couldn't believe it. They were just completely gone. Couldn't breathe, tried to get air, tried to stand up. I thought for sure I was dead. Jim Schmanke had been engulfed by the blast cloud. Although horrifically burned, he survived. His three workmates all died. The blast cloud hugged the land and soared over ridges. It finally deposited its heavy load and dissipated as hot air high into the stratosphere. The explosion ended as abruptly as it began. But the sky was now choked with ash, which turned day to night. On the ground, it appeared to be midnight, although these pictures were taken in Yakima, Washington, just before noon. And I went to church, and I came home, and it was like midnight. I had to turn my lights on coming home from church because it was pitch black. In the immediate area surrounding the volcano, victims heard nothing until a blast cloud was upon them. In simple terms, what's happening is that the sound is refracted up above the volcano. It bounces off the stratosphere, and it comes back down at a distance uh, beyond 60 miles radius away from the volcano. The blast cloud had behaved like a liquid, swirling around the contours of valleys, knocking down trees in circular patterns. It destroyed tens of millions of trees. 57 people had lost their lives. At Mount St. Helens on May the 18th, 1980, scientists had witnessed two events. The landslide was the largest ever recorded, but the most destructive event was the lateral blast. It was a unique opportunity for scientists to witness an extraordinary event. Scientific instruments had been used to measure an actual eruption. 
It gave them an understanding about the way volcanoes work. Mount St. Helens taught us a lot. I think most people around the world would agree that it was the start of modern volcanology in terms of really using instruments to start to predict what's going to happen at other volcanoes around the world. They, they don't erupt according to a pattern. They don't follow any sort of periodicity. They erupt when they want to, and there's no way to forecast which volcano will be active next. A lot of nature is inherently unpredictable, so I think we can probably give time windows. I don't think we'll ever be able to give a, a precise time and date. Meanwhile, people along the northwest coast of America continue to live in the shadow of these particularly destructive and violent volcanoes. For them, the only certainty is that one of these mountains will erupt again soon.